And what I love, Gabe, is that node investing, it's one of the greatest ways to increase the predictability of your cash flow. It adds a lot of stability. And this is the Money Seed Podcast, where we discuss all things investing, plain and simple, the way it should be. Please remember, this show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not intended to be investment advice. Welcome back to the Money Seed Podcast. I am thrilled to have Fred Moskowitz with us today. Fred is a note investor, and he's going to tell us all about notes, what they are, why he's investing in them, and how we can get involved in notes as well. Fred, welcome to the show. Thank you, Gabe. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure. Fred, I think you have a fantastic background. I think you found something really interesting here with notes investing. It's something, to be honest with you, I haven't heard about uh, until very recently. I've never invested in notes myself. So why don't we start at the very top? What is notes investing and what are notes? Yeah, absolutely. No, let's talk about what note investing is. Uh, I'll start out by saying that a lot of people are familiar with investing in real estate and owning real estate, whether it's houses or commercial property or multifamily or even vacation properties, right? Set up as uh, short-term rentals or Airbnb properties. And so what note investing is, it's when we get into investing in the paper, the financing side of these transactions. And that is all the notes and mortgages associated with those properties. And I feel that this is really an interesting part of the real estate business. And for some reason, a lot of real estate investors don't pay any attention to it. And most investors, when they think about a note and a mortgage, they think about being the borrower but not from the perspective as being the lender. But what note investing does, it allows you as an investor to step across the aisle and become the bank. And when you do this, you transition from being the one that's making the monthly payments to being the one receiving the monthly payments. And what I love, Gabe, is that note investing, it's one of the greatest ways to increase the predictability of your cash flow. It adds a lot of stability. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of investments we can get involved in. But as far as being able to produce consistent income, consistent cash flow, I feel that known investing is one of the best asset classes for that. So let me get this straight. So it sounds like you own somebody else's mortgage. Is that That's, a correct way to say it? Okay. Yeah, that, that is correct. You, you own the mortgage and it could be that you, um, you created the mortgage or you could buy a mortgage and note that exists already. That's the area I focus on. So we buy a lot of loans that were originated by banks, institutional lenders. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that, that you and, a lot of the audience can relate to this. Have you ever bought a property or refinanced a property and you go to closing, you sign all the loan documents, and then you start making your monthly payments, but usually around three months or maybe six months later, you get a letter in the mail from the lender saying, dear Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner, we're writing to advise you that your loan is being sold. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's happened to me. Yeah, yeah, it happens at all the almost all the time. And your loan is being sold. Here's the address of the new lender. And starting next month, please send your payment to the new lender. Here's their contact info. And by the way, don't worry. None of the terms of your financing will change. Interest rate is the same. Payments the same. Everything's the same. Um, and so this this is what happens. Loans get originated. And then they're sold off into the secondary mortgage market. And the secondary market is huge. Loans are sold, bought and sold every single day 
there. Uh, they're often bought and packaged into mortgage-backed securities or other Wall Street products. After a few years, they get broken down again and then resold. And so there's always notes uh, being sold. They might be sold by big giant hedge funds on Wall Street or sold by individual investors, smaller investors that uh, have a smaller portfolio. They 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 often sell notes as well. And so these are all these different um, transactions taking place. And the borrower has no say in the matter. Um, this, this happens. They have to be notified of it. Of course, there's disclosure, but they can't... Uh, they can't do anything about it except mm -hmm. continue making the the payments as agreed, because uh, in every every loan set of loan documents, it's disclosed in there that the lender will probably sell the loan at some point. Yeah, and I always thought that was very strange. I'm, I clearly remember the first time that happened to me, where I got that letter in the mail from my lender saying, "Just FYI." We were transferring this mortgage to another company and starting on this and this date, you'll be making payments to that other company, that mm -hmm. other company will be in touch with you. And then I get a letter from them a few weeks later saying, we're your new lender. But like you yeah. said, nothing changes, right? Same monthly payment, same outstanding balance is just, I have to send a check to a different place. Exactly. So from the perspective of the consumer, the borrower, everything's the same. Everything is as they agreed to in the loan documents. Those loan documents are a contract. You have a promissory note. That's the note that you promise to pay on this agreed schedule. And then the mortgage or the deed of trust, that is where you are giving up a security interest in the property to the lender. And they have that as collateral backing, backing uh, the loan. And so uh, if anything goes wrong, th then uh, the lender is secured, uh, secured on title as a lien holder. And if that property is ever sold or transferred to transfer a clear title, all, all those liens have to be uh, resolved and cleared up. And so that will involve getting the loan paid off. Right. And we'll get into the mechanics and the details later on, but I guess to start off, and this is what... I didn't know for many years. I remember the first time this happened to me, I didn't know what to make. And I'm like, I got this letter in the mail. Is my is my bank not happy with me anymore? Like I'm making my monthly payments. I have uh, a credit rating. Why, why, why are they dumping me, right? Yeah. It wasn't until later that I found out that this happens all the time. This is just a business transaction. It is. It has nothing to do with me. Tell me, why do why. banks, yeah, why do banks do it? What's in it for them? Well, think about this. Banks have a business model where they want to originate loans, they have the staff, the processes in place, the marketing to bring borrowers to them, all, all of that. And so their business objective is to originate loans. And so they originate loans and then they sell them and then recoup their capital. Now they can turn around the next day and originate a new loan for someone else. They do this in very high volume. And they they don't uh, the thing that people people have to realize is they make their money because there's some transaction fees and different different things like that and then they'll receive a couple of months of payments let's say 6 months worth of payments right well if you think about how an amortization schedule is set up the first couple of years every payment is almost all interest only you know, very small Correct. slice of that goes to paying down the principal. And so the banks, the loan balance, it, it's fairly close to what it originally started as. The lender collected six months of interest or however many months a year could be. So then they made, they made enough money there and now they'll sell the loan, turn around and do it all over again. It's that concept of velocity of money. And they do this at a massive scale, high volume, and they make a little bit of money on each loan and they keep everything going that way. Which makes sense, right? Because the, the money is in the fees at the beginning from the loan origination. But exactly. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, there are government laws. I don't know if it's the SEC or the IRS or, or, the, or the Fed, but 
they govern how much a bank can lend out and how much cash they need on hand. So I guess the bank wants to have more and more cash on hand so they can originate more loans. They can't just create loans ad infinitum, or I right. might be wrong. No, um, there, there's a balance there. And they have everything set up in place so that loans can be immediately sold. Um, got it. Even, even if you go through a mortgage broker instead of a bank, the same thing is happening. Those mortgage brokers take the, they originate the loans. They already have a lender ready to buy them. Um, and they, they may buy all the loans that were originated that week or that month. And so that that's set up. It's, it's done uh, as designed in to fit into a process. And that's why a lot of times you borrowers, may feel that, oh, why are banks so picky, so strict about every single dot on the I, every single cross on the T about all oh, the documentation and all of this. The reason why is because the loans have to be standardized into a bucket based on the risk profile and they have to meet every single qualification. Otherwise, it'll get kicked out and not get bought. And so uh, that that's another another part of of how that works. So but the loans are originated already with the idea in mind that they're going to be sold on the secondary market. Interesting. And so let's go back to a time when mortgage rates were lower, right? And yeah. so walk me through how the math works. Because in my mind, let's say hypothetically speaking, I buy an investment property. It's listed for $100,000. I put $20,000 down. I take out a mortgage for $80,000. Mm -hmm. So that mortgage exists. I sign all the papers. Like you said, I start making a monthly payments on the mortgage for a few months. And then let's say after six months, the outstanding balance is very close to $80,000, right? Because most of the first payments, as you mentioned, were interest. So let's say the outstanding balance is $79,500. Yep. But let's say the mortgage rate is very low. It's three, three and a half percent. Why would anybody buy that loan if the return is only three, three and a half percent? I mean, uh, I, there must be something else in there to convince a buyer such as yourself or a hedge fund to buy it. How, how do they get higher returns? Well, that that's get happens a little little further down the line, but uh, the the rate of return is um, affected by the discount. Loans are sold at a discount. They're actually sold for less than the amount owed on the loan balance. And so when that happens, that causes for the investor, the rate of return goes up. So let's say a note is at 6% and it was $100,000 loan balance. Well, if the loan gets sold at a discount for $90,000 or $85,000, now that starts to drive the rate of return up higher. And depending on how much risk the investor wants to take on that impacts the discount as well, um, and so that 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 really plays into it. And there's uh, we can get into it more, but there's just many factors that impact the risk profile and the discount. It might be the equity position on on the loan, or it might be something with the track record and payment history on the loan, or it could be some type of a problem. Uh, with documentation or a title issue that has come up that has to be resolved. So these are some of the different scenarios that happen. And so for node investors that understand how to work with these type of issues, uh, you can negotiate a discount to buy a loan, correct the problems, and then increase the value of the asset as well. So you create creating some value. Those are some of the some of the more advanced strategies where um, note investors start to venture out from buying a note that's in perfect condition, perfect shape, and being more comfortable with taking on some risk or taking on some problems and being able to solve those. Got it. So that makes sense. And I think you hit on two important points. So let's keep it to the first example that's simple where I'm a, let's say it's my 79000 $500 outstanding mortgage, and I have a great credit history. I've made every payment. I'm up to date on my property taxes. So let's say the bank sells that to you at a discount. So maybe you, you only pay $75,000 to assume that loan. Mm -hmm. So you bought that loan for $75,000, but I still owe you $79,500 plus interest. Correct. And so that's the, that's the, re the, the additional return you get yeah. on top of my interest rate. That makes sense. Exactly. And then I think the 
The second thing you got into is some loans are problematic, right? Like for example, yeah. if I fall behind, mm -hmm. then now maybe there's a risk that you won't collect. You're like, hey, you know what? Gabe is is uh, is behind on his payments. He's not paying his property taxes. I'm behind. I'm only taking that loan for sixty thousand because there's a risk there that Gabe is is going to default. Is that is that how it works? Yeah, there's there's more risk there. Or maybe the property value. Let's say payment history is perfect, but the property value went down, like we saw in um, you know twenty twenty ten in that in that time period where property values went down and that started to change equity position. And so um there's more risk there, but maybe the borrower still making payments on time every time, right? Uh most people do that. Most borrowers will continue to make payments even if the property value goes down because they want to continue living in the house. That's where they live. That's where their family is. And so, um, some of these different, different scenarios will, will come up where it impacts pricing and the loan cannot be sold, uh, is as the same pristine product that it was once was in the past. It changes and evolves over time. And so when you buy a note as an investor, uh, that's some of the risks you're taking on is you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Right. Something could happen. Right. There, there could be a problem or you could even buy a note and two months later, the borrower refinances or sells the property. You never know. There is an element of randomness that comes into play. So, so Fred, how did you get involved in this? And maybe uh, uh, tell us, I mean, between the banks selling the loans to other banks or banks selling it to mutual funds, how did you as an individual investor Maybe take us through your first deal. How did you get your first note deal? Yeah, that that's a great question. It, this is how how things happen in um, in the note investing industry. It was, it was through a personal relationship, right? I was very involved in real estate investing and involved in some different groups. And through some relationships I had, I met someone that was involved in note investing and they they had notes they were selling and the reason they were selling the notes there was nothing wrong with them but they bought a large pool of notes and kept some and then sold some so so they could do what recoup their capital and do another deal and so that was part of their business model so i met some of these individuals and um I had heard about node investing and knew a little bit about it, but never had the opportunity to be able to buy notes. So when I was presented with that, I knew exactly what it was and um and I jumped in. And it it's it's been a wonderful journey ever since. I started out with just a couple of notes and continued growing, moved on to buying larger pools of notes and buying notes in my retirement account and just using all these different strategies um, that, that have become very powerful. And over time, uh, you start to scale and, and grow larger and larger. And that's, that's what happens. So it, it, it's been a wonderful journey, journey for me. And um, that, that's how I got started though. It was all, all through personal relationships, but that's something that never changes in node investing. Everyone does business with each other. We're a small community, small world. We all know each other. And so it's important to uh, be an upstanding individual, do, do business with integrity, um, do what you say you're going to do. This goes for any investing, really That's does. what I was going to say. Yeah, this yeah. is a good advice for any investor. And yeah, you know, you know what I love, Gabe. When you do a transaction and it goes well, I love doing things so that the other person, the counterparty, they walk away saying, "Wow, that was great. That was such a great transaction." I look forward to doing another one again in the future. And the next time they have notes to sell, I want to be the one that gets that first call. I want to be top of mind. And the way you get to that 
is by performing, performing on your obligations, on your contracts, do what you say you're going to do. And when you have that kind of a reputation, that's going to serve you really well, um, especially in something like this where it, it can get transactional. But um, getting yourself set up for success, having those relationships, having a good network of people to work with is uh, going to serve you very well. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. So, Fred, tell me, how many years have you been doing this? I've been doing this for uh, 13 years. I started in oh, wow. 2010. 2010 was a very different times in the world of mortgages, for sure. Um, but uh, it, it's it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. So it, it, tell me a little bit more, because I, I believe that you have a background in tech. You used to yeah. be a, a software engineer. And I know that uh, software engineers typically have very good salaries, especially in the area where I live, which is the Bay Area. So, I mean, this yeah, must be going you're, very you're well for the, you. Tell yeah. me a little bit more about like how you started with your first deal. At what point did you say, you know what? I can do this full time. I don't need my W-2. I got this. Yeah. Well, I started out... Um, lo- I had a very long and successful career working as a computer engineer. And um, I spent a lot, a lot of time working at different startup companies. It was an exciting time. I I witnessed the, the birth of the internet and was somewhat involved in, in that. And what happened was um I lived through the bursting of the dot-com bubble. And right around the same time, we had the September 11th terrorist attacks, all this turmoil in the world. The tech industry was in complete shambles. And what I realized was that I was taking on huge risk because the only source of income I had was my paycheck for my job. And I realized that no matter how good of an engineer I was, how talented I was, how good, dedicated of an employee I was. If things were not going well in the industry or at the company where I was, I could quickly lose my job through no fault of my own. And so I realized I needed to start building other income sources. And so that's what I did. I turned to alternative investing, got involved in real estate. I was doing some private deals and each one of them was adding to my monthly cash flow. And I continued working as an engineer. But what happened, Gabe, was that one day I realized that I was bringing in enough income for my investments to cover all my living expenses. And when that happened, I knew that I could now continue working because I wanted to and not because I had to. And when that happens, it totally uh, changes your your mindset and your paradigm completely. And that's where I was. That's where I was. I, I continued doing doing both for a number of years, but eventually my investing activities grew. Um, I ended up starting a fund, and um, that that was the right time where I said I need to really focus on uh, on investing and dedicate myself to that and so i made made the transition but that has been um that has been wonderful i i find it so rewarding working uh working for myself and um also educating and teaching other investors that um that I work with and it's really rewarding. So I I just love that. And, you know, it's funny, a lot of the engineering uh, ways of thinking and the systems, creating systems and analysis, a lot of that has served me so well with notes in analyzing notes and performing due diligence, setting up processes and systems to do all of this. And so that has really uh, been such a valuable valuable asset for me in uh, in this space absolutely yeah i have an engineering background as well and so i can definitely relate to the processes and the numbers and, and all that good stuff yeah but yeah fred i mean congratulations it's i mean anyone that can 
build a business that is successful enough to quit their W-2, I think is, is an amazing achievement. So congratulations on that. Um, Fred, why don't we take it a little bit back to maybe setting expectations for people who are interested in getting into the space. Yeah. Um, so let's say, let's compare this to most people are comfortable or, or at least are knowledge, knowledgeable about investing in the market, right? I can go, I can buy an S&P 500 ETF like SPY, or you know, I can invest in tech in the queues or whatever. And mm-hmm. over 10, 20 years, I'm going to get 8% or 10% or uh, something like that. How does this compare to those returns? What kind of returns do you think are are reasonable compared to the similar type of risk as the stock market? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So in general, uh, I like the idea of investing in assets as part of your investment portfolio. And what are assets? Assets are things that you can own. They have tangible value and they generate income. And assets can be in many different forms. They could be owning real estate, for instance, that generates income. Uh, It could be royalties, uh, royalties and patents where that's licensed out to others and you get paid for that, right? That's, That's another way. And you see that a lot with music and movies and patents. Uh, books, having a book, there's royalties involved as well. Uh, and of course, my favorite notes, right? Notes, you buy them, you own them. And the thing about it is you get paid while you wait because all throughout your ownership, you have income coming in, um, which is different than, for instance, stock market investments where you invest your money, the value increases, but if you want to get cash from that, you have to sell off some some of your position. And so uh, it's a little bit of a different dynamic with different nuances there. And so what I always advocate for is diversify, have some investment in in that, have some investment in real estate, but own and own other investments that generate capital for you. Because there may be times in your life where you need that income, maybe there's been an interruption in your work and you have to rely on investment income for a while. Maybe there's, you know, an interruption in your in your job. A lot of people experience that throughout the pandemic. But what about if you have the birth of a child and you want to take some time off so you can spend with your newborn? Or maybe you have to care for a family member that's that's uh, in poor health. And having this, it allows you that flexibility because in the end, isn't that what we all want in life is to have flexibility, have options. And so uh, being set up financially with a a good solid foundation, that really goes a long way to uh, allowing that for for people. So I always encourage uh, everyone to get, learn about, different strategies, see what you can put into practice for yourself, but don't be someone. And I I was once in the same place where the only investments that I had, it was my 401k plan at work and maybe some mutual funds in a a brokerage account. And that's it. It's hundred percent in the stock market, hundred percent. That's not, not a good place to be. Uh, I agree. And so it, it's, and it takes, it takes uh, having an interest, having a thirst for learning, because you don't learn about any of this in school. You got to get self educated on it, pursue education by taking workshops and seminars, reading books, listening to great podcasts. That's how you learn. That's how you, you find out about different strategies, different concepts. And uh, aligning yourself with with the right individuals that are successful and that can teach you as well. Because what I love about being in the investment space is the people that are good at it, they're always looking to share their knowledge and skills and expertise with others. And it just fosters this environment where uh, people are looking to uplift and uplevel each other and grow together. 
And that's wonderful. And I would echo those statements. I would add one more tip, not only listen to podcasts, but start your own podcast. <laughs> you know, I would, <laughs> I would say I am really impressed and I'm amazed at how, like you said, how supportive and how helpful the investment community is. You know, since I started this podcast, you know, I think this is when this gets published in a few weeks, it'll be somewhere like episode 45 or something like that. And I'm always amazed at how people such as yourself will take the time out of their day and speak to me and answer my questions and explain you know how, how they how they invest their money and stuff like that. So I'm I'm really yeah. I'm really enamored with the community, and I would echo your statements that um, yeah the the earlier in life you get involved with the investment community, the more connections you make, the better network you build. It's just going to pay dividends later on in life. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Fred, if somebody wants to get involved in the note space, um, mm -hmm. how much money would you recommend they start with? Because it it sounds like you, someone needs a, a, a respectable amount of cash to say, okay, you know, I'm going to buy this mortgage. How, yeah. how much would you recommend is a is a good minimum that that is reasonable? Yeah, let's let's explore that a little bit. Um, notes, note investing. You need capital to um, to buy notes. They're bought in all cash transactions, and so for someone starting out, you may need to. Um, to get your money from a different different source. Maybe you have uh, some rental real estate that, that you have equity in that you can tap or uh, you've sold a property. We, we see this all the time. Um, there's a couple of different ways to get involved in node investing. Um, you can, and I talk about this in, in my book, in the little green book of node investing, we, we cover a lot of this. You can start out investing and in buying individual notes, maybe buying some smaller notes. That's going to be a more active approach, more hands-on, more work. Uh, and if you have the time to dedicate and you want to learn the business, it's it's the way to go. For other folks that maybe are busy with their profession or they're a business owner and they're focused on that, a great option is to be a passive investor. Maybe you, you can invest in a note fund where the fund manager raises capital and then they'll go out to the secondary market and buy notes in bulk. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is allows for better pricing, better access to notes, and um, and they have the relationships in place to be able to buy notes. And so for the investors, it's a great way to join forces and be a part of something bigger than, than just yourself. And you get to leverage the experience, the expertise, and the relationships of the fund managers, and that can be very powerful. And so those are some of the different ways to get involved with node investing. Now, as far as how much do you need, th there's really no limit. Um, notes can be bought that have very small balances, five, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 loan balance. There's notes like that. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have those big jumbo mortgages that go up past a million dollars. What I will caution investors is find a way where you can invest the capital that you have. Don't put it all into one single note. Uh, let's say you had $100,000 to invest. Well, maybe you can split that up into four, four smaller notes so that you get some diversification. If you're investing in a note fund, uh, what's nice there is you're getting diversified. Your capital will be spread out over hundreds of notes or thousands of notes. And note funds, different funds have different minimum. They'll have a minimum investment amount. Um, some will be very small, like 10 or 20,000. Um, very common to see 50,000 and others are 100,000. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just a matter of finding one that lines up with, uh, with your requirements and also with the time frame that you, your investment is illiquid. And you have to be okay with that. And so you want to look at what's the time horizon so that you understand when your capital will be returned to you. And does that uh, time schedule align with, with your needs? Because if you're investing, let's say, retirement account funds, 
it's less important for you to get that money back quickly, especially if you're years off from retirement, as opposed to someone that needs that sooner, then they might be looking at a, a different strategy or looking at notes that pay back on a faster amortization schedule. Interesting. So it sounds like some of these funds are not very liquid. In other words, you can't just withdraw your money anytime. Yeah, mo most, it, it, yes, that's correct. Most private investments where there's a private offering, they're not liquid and you have to be okay with that. And so uh, whether it's a real estate syndication or a note fund or uh, any, any investment, usually they're not liquid and you have to be very careful that you're not going to need your money back. And so being diversified where maybe you have other assets that are more liquid so that if you need, need the capital, it's accessible to you. Got it. And Fred, tell us a little bit more about your fund. How many different loans do you have, like notes do you have in your fund right now? And what is the minimum investment for your fund? And what kind of returns are you targeting? I know you can't promise a return, but maybe tell us yeah, a little bit about I, the performance and the, and the target. Well, note funds, uh, I'm going to just speak in general terms, right? Note funds come in all shapes and sizes. There are funds that are low risk. They're going to pay a lower rate of return, uh, maybe 5 6%. And there's other funds that focus more on high risk, higher return activities that can get up in the double digits, right? It, for any of you real estate investors that are familiar with hard money loans, mm -hmm. right? That they make loans to the guys that do fix and flip properties. Most of those loans are funded out of a, a note fund and um, those are, those are considered higher risk. And so, there is the low end and high end and everything in between. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's it's uh, for you to consider to see what you're comfortable with. Everyone has a different risk tolerance. And um, that's, that's a bit about how the note fund landscape works. Um, and fund managers will have different offerings at any given time that become open, that close. And it it really varies and a lot of it is adapting to what's available in the marketplace at a given time but uh i i know many people in the industry i see a lot of the different different funds out there the different strategies there's no note funds that focus on residential only there's others that focus on commercial only specifically and um hard money loans is is another example that that's out there it's very popular because a lot of uh investors are in the real estate game and they're looking for uh, alternative forms of financing so it's a great way for them to fund their deals and they get them turned around quickly those are typically short-term loans that maybe six months or 12 months or 18 months in duration, and then they're paid off, but they have a very high interest rate. It's not uncommon to see 12, 14% uh, interest rate on those loans. But for the investor that's doing the rehab, the renovation, they're good with that because it's not a long-term loan. They're in and out as quickly as they can because they buy the property, they renovate it, and then they sell it as fast as possible. And then they get that loan paid off and then they're off to the next deal. That's, so it sounds like there's different options, right? If investors want something that's low risk, low return, they can find it within the note space. And yeah. if somebody wants something that's high, higher risk, higher return, they can find that in the note space. Exactly, exactly. Fred, uh, just maybe humor me a little bit. Um, can you tell me about two deals? Let's talk about maybe the best note deal that you did personally and maybe the worst. Like, let, let's have a spread of like, what is the mm -hmm. best possible outcome and the worst? Great. Yeah, I absolutely. Um, love talking about different, different case studies. Um, I had a note. Here, here's something that happened. I had a note where... Um, the opportunity to buy a note. The seller was someone I knew. Uh, they had owned the note for years and years. 
They made tons of money off of it. It had a good interest rate. And they were they were presented with some other deal to get into. They needed to raise capital very quickly. So they came to me and said, Fred, are you interested in this note? I know you're liquid. If we can get a transaction done quickly, that's what I need. I'll sell it to you at a decent discount. And so I bought the note. I bought it at a significant discount uh, from what was owed. Um, and so what ended up happening was uh, we transferred the note, we transferred the servicing, all, all of that. Um, I funded the transaction. The seller was thrilled because they got the money quickly. We did this in, in about a week, right? Very fast. And I started receiving the monthly payments. Well, wouldn't you know, uh, I don't think it was more than six or nine months went by that um, the loan servicer got gets a call from the title company with the borrower. They were selling the property or refinancing it. And so the loan was getting paid off. And I was called upon to uh, authorize and sign off on a payoff quote. And that discount that, that I had negotiated that difference between the loan balance and the discount, that was all profit coming in out of the blue, totally unexpected. And so that came in. It was uh, one of these um, fantastic deals that uh, everything just ended up lining up and I was not expecting it. And so that allowed me to make a nice profit. And then now my my job was now to get that capital deployed quickly uh, and find other notes to buy. And so that that's what I did. So that was a deal that worked out really, uh, really nice. Now, as far as ones that didn't go well, <clears throat> um, we had here, – here's one where uh, I bought – and this was in my early days. I bought a very small note. It was like – Let's say the loan balance might have been like six thousand or seven thousand dollars. Very small. It was a second lien, second mortgage. I bought the note, and I was um, learning, still learning business. We got everything set up, got 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 it transferred, and everything. And looking back at it later on. I started to question myself saying, why did I do that? Um, it's the same work, the same number of hours, the same expenses and costs and fees that you have to pay for a, for a $7,000 note that you would have to pay on a $70,000 note or a $700,000 note, right? Take it even further. It's the same amount of work. And so when you look at the return on your investment and return on your time, it was a horrible deal. Even though I was getting payments, everything was as expected, that was one where the lesson learned was never again. I'm not going to do that because it's just not a good use of, of time. And my time is precious. So uh, I want to always be putting it towards the highest and best use. So those smaller deals, I learned to not like them very quickly. And you you will see this. You will see why for uh, any real estate investors that deal with lower priced properties, there's a threshold where banks, normal banks are not going to lend. They're not going to write a loan for less than... Mm -hmm. You know, a property under a hundred thousand, it's going to be tough finding a lender that will do that loan. Under fifty thousand, probably not. Not going to happen. And so, uh, it's the same reason. It's because the time is the same. The time of the people that have to work on it, and the cost and expense all the same. And so that that doesn't bode well for a business that's trying to do something in volume. Makes sense. Yeah. You definitely want to take advantage of economies of scale, right? By going bigger, the fees are the same. 
maybe a little bit, what are some of those fees? I imagine there's uh, maybe you do a lien search, mm-hmm. a title search, you got some attorneys involved. What, what is yeah. typically involved in buying one of these? Yeah, there, there's a number of different <clears throat> different fees. There are uh, fees with doing searches and data related, right? Maybe you'll um, you'll get a BPO on the property, a price price opinion where someone goes out, <clears throat> pulls comps, and um, establishes a value of the property without doing a full appraisal with. The appraiser goes in. It's all done from from the exterior. Uh, title searches, checking liens, any anything you have to pay to your to the attorney for legal work. Um, there may be document review. If you're less comfortable with looking over loan documents, it may make sense for you to hire your attorney to spend an hour and pay them for an hour of their time at their rate to go through all the loan documents to make sure everything is proper, that it's a valid lien, that it's enforceable, and the documents were recorded properly in the county courthouse. And there are recording fees as well, recording fees that um, that have to be paid to record the documents, record the transfer loan documents as well. And um, another cost and expense that's very important is the loan servicer. And let's talk about that. What is a loan servicer? The loan servicer acts as the front end to manage the note and they will interface with the borrower. They will collect the payments from the borrower. They will answer phone calls. They will keep track of the amortization schedule and accounting on the note. They will send out the annual tax um, tax and interest statements to the to the borrower and to the lender. And so they handle a lot of the day-to-day management. And there's a cost for this. It's it's very reasonable. They charge usually between $15 and $30 a month per loan. But it's it's a huge burden they take off uh the investor for handling this. Think of a loan servicer the same way that a property manager will manage a rental property. The loan servicer will manage the loans on behalf of the lender. And so they, they're they they're set up to handle its scale uh, and loan servicers handle thousands and thousands of loans uh, on an ongoing basis. And so that's something that allows for an investor to scale up to be able to do that because you don't have to do the day-to-day uh, admin and, and maintenance on, on, on your portfolio. Makes sense. Fred, you've taken your experience and you put it inside a book. The book is called Little Green Book of Note Investing. It's available on Amazon and other websites. Tell us a little bit more about the book and what can people learn from it? Yeah, that's, thank you. It's, um, it's a great high-level introductory overview of the note business and how it works. And so there are, um, we we cover how how the note industry works, why do loans get bought and sold, just like I was describing earlier. Uh, There are chapters on how to perform due diligence, how to analyze a note so that you can evaluate the characteristics. Um, There's also, chapters on how to manage the portfolio, manage the note, getting it transferred. And uh, my favorite part is there's two chapters dedicated to how to do note investing using retirement account funds, which is a very powerful strategy. But there are ways to use your retirement account funds, whether you have a 401k or an IRA, you can invest that capital into notes. And what I love is that you get that preferential tax treatment with those investment assets. And that's powerful because note investing, it generates tax liability for sure. So if you could do that in a Roth IRA, for instance, which is probably the best strategy, you can generate all of that profit and it's tax-free. It comes out tax-free to you. Um, and and so that, that gives, gives a good high-level overview, whether you're interested in 
being directly involved actively as a note investor or looking at note funds and how to evaluate it. It's all covered in uh, in the Little Green Book of Note Investing. So it's a great resource for anyone looking to learn more about this type of investing and this asset class. That sounds great. I will put that in the show notes. Fred, where can people learn more and where can people reach out to you? Thank you. Thank you. I always love connecting with with investors. Best best place to to contact me and connect with me is by visiting my website, which is fredmoskowitz.com. However, if you may prefer an easier spelling, you can visit giftfromfred.com and it'll go to my website. And once you're there, you can sign up to request a special report that I'd be happy to send out uh, about node investing, giving a little more in-depth, in-depth discussion about that. And uh, always looking forward to connecting with investors and learning about what uh, different people are doing, different strategies out there. Oh, and by the way, if you prefer to text me using your mobile device, you can text the keyword money to this number, 215-461-4433, and then follow the prompts. So I always look forward to uh getting to know investors, connecting with people, and building relationships. Like I said earlier, it's one of the most important things that that we can all do. Fred, thanks very much for offering a free gift. If anyone missed that, I will put that into the show notes and in the YouTube video description. Fred Moskowitz, thank you very much for spending time with us today. It's a fascinating area. Like I said, I, I had never heard of note investing until very recently, and I really appreciate you telling us all about it. Yeah, thank you, Gabe. Thank you for having me on.